Blessed be God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And blessed be God's kingdom, now and forever. Amen. in you. Mercifully accept our prayers, and because in our weakness we can do nothing good without you, give us the help of your grace, that in keeping your commandments we may please you both in will and deed. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. The Lessons, Jeremiah, thus says the Lord, cursed are those who trust in mere mortals and make mere flesh their strength, whose hearts turn away from the Lord. They shall be like a shrub in the desert and shall not see when relief comes. They shall live in the parched places of the wilderness in an uninhibited salt land. Blessed are those who trust in the Lord whose trust is the Lord, 
They shall be like a tree planted by water, sending out its roots by the stream. It shall not fear when he comes, and its leaves shall stray, stay green. In the year of drought, it is not anxious, and it does not cease to bear fruit. The heart is devious. Above all else, it is perverse. Who can understand it? I, the Lord, test the mind and search the heart to give to all according to their ways, according to the fruit of their doings. The word of the Lord. Psalm 1. Happy are they who have not walked in the counsel of the wicked, nor lingered in the way of sinners, nor sat in the seats of the scorn. <clears throat> Their delight is in the law of the Lord, and they meditate on his law day and night. water, bearing fruit with leaves that do not wither. Everything they do shall prosper. It is not so with the wicked. They are like chaff which the wind blows away. They are not stand upright when judgment comes, nor the sinner in the counsel of the righteous. The Lord knows the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked is doomed. A reading from the first letter of Paul to the Corinthians. Now, if Christ is proclaimed as raised from the dead, how can some of you say that there is no resurrection of the dead? If there is no resurrection of the dead, then Christ has not been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, then our proclamation has been in vain and your faith has been in vain. We are even found to be misrepresenting God because we testified of God that he raised Christ whom he did not raise, if it is true that the dead are not raised. For if the dead are not raised, then Christ has not been raised. If Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile, and you are still in your sins. Then those who have died in Christ have perished. If for this life only we have hoped in Christ, we are of all people most to be pitied. But in fact, Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have died. The word of the Lord. Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to Luke. Glory to you, Lord Christ. Jesus came down with the twelve apostles and stood on a level place with a great crowd of his disciples and a great multitude of people from all Judea, Jerusalem, the coast of Tyre and Sidon. They had come to hear him and to be healed of their diseases, and those who were troubled with unclean spirits were cured. And all in the crowd were trying to touch him, for power came out from him and healed all of them. Then he looked up at his disciples and said, Blessed are you who are poor, 
for yours is the kingdom of God. Blessed are you who are hungry now, for you will be filled. Blessed are you who weep now, for you will laugh. Blessed are you when people hate you and when they exclude you, revile you, and defame you on account of the Son of Man. Rejoice in that day and leap for joy, for surely your reward is great in heaven, for that is what their ancestors did to the prophets. But woe to you who are rich, for you have received your consolation. Woe to you who are full now, for you will be hungry. Woe to you who are laughing now, for you will mourn and weep. Woe to you when all speak well of you, for that is what their ancestors did to the false prophets. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Christ. Ms. Florence Lewis was probably one of the most influential people in my life when I was growing up. She was, oh, I don't know how old she was. She uh, probably, I always picture her in her 40s or maybe 50s. But she was tiny, little bitty lady, but so fierce. She dedicated her whole life to helping the poor. She volunteered and maybe even worked some of the time at the halfway house that the Episcopal Church ran. She lived in the neighborhood, and everybody knew her. She ran um, the volunteer program for during Christmas when people could donate toys that then would be distributed to children in need, and she had very high standards, no hand-me-down toys, knew um, nothing broken, only the best. Volunteers who would come and help wrap presents with her, if she didn't like how they were wrapped, she would have them do it again. Um, I've told you before how my mother uh, started a non-for-profit, a, a day camp for kids, and a lot of the children in Miss Lewis's neighborhood came to our camp. And whenever she would stop by, if we were in the gym, over 100 children would, went silent because it walked Miss Lewis. One of my favorite things about her is that she helped... Um, with the Kairos prison ministry that, that people volunteer to be a part of. And, and when she would go and visit people in jail, she didn't rush. She took her time. She listened. She was with them. And she would bring messages back to their families. And when they got out of jail, she would mentor them. She dedicated her life to helping the poor. And I think about her today because of the gospel that we heard. You might recognize that it sounds kind of like the Sermon on the Mount that we hear in Matthew, where Jesus is up on the mountain, and he gives um, the Beatitudes, and we call it the Sermon on the Mount. And and that image of God, and that image of Jesus, the Messiah, for Matthew is being up high and, and giving us kind of an, inviting us up on the mountain with him to give sort of an overview of what it looks like to live as one who follows Christ. That's not how Luke tells it. Luke says that after Jesus had been praying all night and he chose the 12 apostles, he comes down into the lower level place where the crowd is. And did you notice how big the crowd is? And people from all over? So my assumption is some of these people probably didn't agree on a lot of things politically and and religiously, and they probably wouldn't have wanted to be in each other's company. They were certainly very different But yet here they all were, willing to be together in this place so they can touch Jesus. They can be healed by him. They've heard stories about him, how he's, you know, taking care of those who were possessed with demons. They probably even heard the story about how Peter became wealthier because he met Jesus. Remember, he couldn't catch any fish, and Jesus says, dip the boat, the nets over on this side of the boat, and he does, and suddenly there's tons. So for lots of reasons... Many, many people have come to see him. And he doesn't stay up away from them. He goes down into into their pain, into their suffering, into their greed, into their diseases, whatever it is. And that image of Jesus 
is so different. Imagine what it must have been like for the apostles, and imagine it for ourselves to be standing and seeing Jesus kneeling down, touching a leper, looking up at us. Not looking down at us, but looking up at us, offering his hand to us, come, come and help me help these people. If you were to follow me, that is what it means. It doesn't, he doesn't start, he doesn't um, pick the 12 and then say, okay, everybody sit down, get out your laptops, and I've got to teach you some doctrine. No, he goes right down into the poor. It doesn't matter if you know what you believe yet. Just practice this, and the belief will come. Serve. To follow me is not to be afraid of the diseased, of the poor, of the ones we might want to push aside. He knows that it is uncomfortable for us sometimes to be with those people because it reminds us of our own vulnerability. And he says, get over it. Get down here with me. I love you. Help me love these people. And what are we going to do within what he says after that, with these blessings and these woes? So strange, isn't it? And in the Greek, if we translate the word that we have a blessing, it could also be translated as those that are satisfied, those that are at peace. But it certainly doesn't sound like people that might be at peace to be grieving, to be hungry, to be poor, to be unliked. How is that satisfying? How is that peaceful? And then the woes, the word in Greek for woe, could be translated repent or turn around. Turn around, you that are rich. Turn around, you that are laughing now. Turn around, even when people like you. Sounds opposite. I chewed on this for a long time. And what it occurs to me is that the reason that the folks who seem to live lives that we might say are not lucky, at the very least, the one thing they seem to have that this group may not have is that they are open. They are vulnerable. They know they need. And so they are able to open themselves up to receive. The folks that are comfortable and satisfied have forgotten that even in that state, we still need our relationship with God. It is not our status that makes us whole. It is not our money. It is not the fact that we happen to not be grieving right now or that we're laughing. All of that is fine, but it doesn't make us whole. What makes us whole, what makes us be able to live like the tree we heard about in Jeremiah is that we are connected with God. And in that connection, in that relationship, we become connected to one another. To be a Christian is not to live in isolation by, by yourself. Luke tells us it's about getting down into the dirty depths of life where the real pain and suffering are. To not be afraid. To get down with him. To bring about healing. To bring about hope to bring about love. And some of us will do that in big ways, like Miss Lewis. But some of us will do it at one relationship at a time. And all of it matters. All of that is good fruit bringing about the kingdom. I invite you, I invite all of us, in, as individuals and as a church, to look and see who are the poor among us, who are those that are suffering, Maybe they literally physically are, or maybe they spiritually are. But where are we called to go to kneel down with Jesus, to get, let the dust of the dirtiness of life transform us and bring about the kingdom of God? Amen.
of one God. May the Lord, who searches the deepest recesses of our hearts, be present in the prayers and thanksgivings which we offer this day. As we respond, Hear us, God of glory. God of our salvation, touch every wound within us, and in your mercy, heal us of the pain that racks our inmost thoughts. Hear us, God of glory. Christ, the source of love, let our hands work for the relief of all who are troubled the homeless, the hungry, the distressed, the sick, and the imprisoned, and those whose darkness knows no name. Hear us, God of glory. Creator of the universe, give us grateful hearts to praise the beauty of your handiwork in the world about us, and help us live in ways that protect the fragility of your creation for generations to come. Hear us, God of glory. Holy One, Reveal to us the blessedness with which you have endowed all human life, that we may see ourselves and others as bearers of your image. Hear us, God of glory. God of all joy, may our lips recite songs of thanksgiving as we celebrate the abundance of riches that you have bestowed upon us. And may we joyfully share these gifts with others. Hear us, God of glory. Risen Lord, be present with those who have departed this life and this certain hope of your resurrection, especially Alice Milner on the anniversary of her death, and Rudy King, the brother of Susie Godfrey, who died this week, and comfort all who mourn for those they love but see no more. Hear us, God of glory. With God ever present in the midst of our lives, let us pray for our own needs and those of others. We pray for those who struggle or suffer, including those on our prayer list. We pray for Mary, Elizabeth, David, Don, Patty, Katie, and Margot. We pray for Casey, Robin, Donna, Marilyn, Earl, and Bill. We pray for Linda, Susie, Sam, Chris, Anne, Dorothy, Bill, Barb, and Marty. We pray for Edward, Cindy, John, Frank, Marilyn, Andrew, and Maureen. We pray for Betsy, Megan, Bill, Jill, Stephanie, Hal, Jerry, John, and Craig. And we pray for Harriet, Ray, Helen, Connie, and Bruce. And we pray for Kimberly, Roger, Marilyn, and the Godfrey family. We give thanks for all of God's blessings. Today, especially rejoicing in the birthdays of Walter Garrett and Bonnie Femister and the wedding anniversary of Bob and Colette Kenyon. We give thanks for the ministry of Bishop Anderson House, one of the Compassion Ministries this parish supports, as well as for the members of our choir and all who offer their musical gifts. We pray for the Rector Search Committee, that the Spirit may lead and guide them in their discernment. 
O God, who by the glorious resurrection of your Son, Jesus Christ, destroyed death and brought life and immortality to light, grant that we, who have been raised with him, may abide in his presence and rejoice in the hope of eternal glory. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, to whom with you and the Holy Spirit be dominion and praise forever and ever. Amen. Peace of the Lord be always with you. Peace on this chilly but lovely sixth Sunday of our Epiphany season. I uh, have several things I would, would mention, but I'll try to be brief. The first is I wanted to remind all of the moms uh, in the group, uh, in the congregation, that uh, later this week there's going to be the next gathering of the Moms' Night Out. Information in the bulletin about that, a gathering of people who, of moms, who simply gather for fellowship, friendship, um, and I think that this particular session is going to also be used as a discussion group or a, um, one of the listening sessions for the rector search process. If you haven't been involved in the Moms Night Out before, this would be a great time to, to uh, utilize that opportunity for friendship, fellowship, and conversation. Also wanted to give early notice that a month from today, four weeks from today, on the 13th of March, we will hold our beloved Lenten Evensong featuring our choir, who will this year be offering the Foray Requiem, the Requiem by Gabrielle Foray, one of the most famous and beloved of all choral works. Uh, I think they sang it maybe eight or nine years ago uh, at an Evensong, so it's time to do it again. Uh, that will be the centerpiece of the Evensong, uh, but that beautiful liturgy stands on its own even without such great music. So please plan on the 13th of March to join us at 5 o'clock. There will be a simple reception just next door in the parlor uh, for all who come. Also wanted to let everybody know who is taking part in the Sacred Ground program with Kenilworth Union Church that the next reading <coughs> option or, or uh, 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 material rather, uh, if you don't have your own copy, copies are available in Laurel's office to borrow. We bought some extra copies of the book. So Please feel free to come use that book, and also, though, then, uh, please to return that. That's for those who are getting ready for the second gathering of the Sacred Ground program. At this point, I'd like to ask Greg Anderson to come forward and tell us a little bit about next week's Adult Forum. Yeah, just, a, just a quick announcement, and I, I wanted to let everybody know that next week during the Adult Forum, we have a very special group coming to speak. And, uh, I recognize that it's, it's President's Day weekend, so a lot of people will be away, but if you're available, I, I think you'll find it a, a beneficial visit. But um, Sunshine Gospel is a group that uh, uh, Mike Rolfus and I and a few other people have supported over the years. They're now part of our out outreach program. And they're a group that operates down in the city, and they handle a lot of things that, that normal missions do, which includes you know, shelter and clothing and, and, and uh, education for underprivileged. But they built the core of their base on entrepreneurship. When they arrived in some of these neighborhoods, they realized it wasn't really another church that was in, as important as finding these people jobs. And so they, they've entered a bunch of entrepreneurship programs to both areas of the city as well as South Evanston. They built a lot of businesses. And then they got involved in urban and gang violence. And both of their programs have been nationally recognized. Uh, you don't hear about them. It's designed to be apolitical. So they, they want to stay under the radar. They don't want their programs to be corrupted. 
and they'll be here next week talking about them for you know the, the late to the forum. But I think when we're hearing all the negativity in the press, these are the reasons for hope, and they are taking place. And um, I, I hope if you have time, you'll you find it very interesting. Finally, I wanted to mention that, uh, as we have for the last several weeks, we will continue, for the time being, to have communion here on the pace or the crossing of the two aisles. This is not a permanent move. We will eventually go back to the rail. We are doing this simply to try to cut down on traffic flow, especially through the narrow part of the chancel in the choir area. So please be aware that this is just temporary. Some people have already asked me what will happen if and when the state of Illinois drops the mask mandate for indoor gatherings. We will monitor that, of course, carefully. We will also, though, as we have been throughout the pandemic, uh, be guided by the uh, guidelines uh, of the Diocese of Chicago. Generally, of late, the diocese has been leaving decisions about things like gathering and singing and so forth up to individual congregations. So we will sort of take the temperature of the congregation if and when the indoor mass mandate is lifted by the state of Illinois. So please uh, uh, know that all of this, again, is still temporary and in flux and very fluid. And thank you, as always, over these last two years for your patience, your understanding, as we all continue to journey this unique road together. Ascribe to the Lord the honor due his name. Bring offerings and come into his court with praise and thanksgiving.
11, praying with those who are worshiping with us virtually, let us offer God our prayer. Gracious God, we believe that you are truly present in the holy sacrament of the altar. And since we cannot at this time all receive communion together, we pray that you would enter into our spirits. We unite ourselves with you and embrace you in heart, soul, body, and mind. Let nothing separate us from you. Let us serve you in this life, nourished by your presence, and by the grace of all for us. of God, for the people of God.
Let us pray. Eternal God, Heavenly Father, you have graciously accepted us as living members of your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ. And you have fed us with spiritual food in the sacrifice of his body and heart. Send us now to the world in peace, and grant us strength and courage to love and serve you with gladness and singleness of heart. Through Christ our Lord. May Christ, the Son of God, be manifest in you, that your lives may be a light to the world. And the blessed God Almighty, Creator, Redeemer, and Sustainer, be upon you and remain with you this day and always. Amen. <laughs>